variations. I've been a member here at Hacker Dojo for like a whole whopping five months, and I love it. I remember hearing about Hacker Dojo um, starting over 20 years ago. What I didn't know until recently is that uh, this dojo started from people with a great idea that we're attending the uh, Cabin Pop-Up Super Happy Dev House. That we go from house to house every month or so, and people have hackathons. And some people thought, hey, why can't we make this like a permanent thing? Have a permanent home with uh, equipment, coffee, and, and everything else. So Hacker Dojo is a permanent home, open to members 24 seven. We get access to uh, gig Wi-Fi, symmetric, lasers, labs, classroom, quiet booths, Events for free, and the best part, each other. Um, I'm also learning that many household name companies um, were conceived here at the dojo over the years. Um, so I invite you to sign up for either the monthly or the highly discounted annual plan. Um, I did. So um, let's get into what lightning talks are all about. So um, it's basically an open mic. Lightning talks are opportunity to share um, work you're doing, um, project you might be working on. You can plug your startup or your project, maybe volunteer activities you wanna talk about. You can come up and play music. You know, provide something of the value to the group here and share and help us all learn, um, or most anything else. So speakers will have about five minutes. Actually, it's a full house tonight, so we're gonna have like, keep a tight schedule, five minutes to pitch, followed by a very short time for questions and answers. Um, after the lightning talks are over, then people can mingle and you can have your long drawn out discussions and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so speakers, do come up when it's your turn and you've got this nice mic here. I'll demo it. Okay. And just clip it on nice and snug up here so we can all hear you. And if it is, tether to a cord. Um, that way you get the best sound pop. That way we get the best sound possible. Um, if you're projecting, you can plug your laptop into this table. Um, audience, we ask you um, to respect the speakers, um, let them have their um, talk, and then ask short questions afterwards. If it's a longer discussion, we'll have it afterwards. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we're all being excellent to each other. That's our motto here at the Hacker Dojo. Um, so also when we uh, ask questions, please raise your hand. I'll bring this microphone over to you. And this is what we call the, the Hacker Dojo position is about right here so we can hear you clearly. Um, that's important because um, we've been working diligently here uh, with this side here. It's been helping us to um, bring these lightning talks to YouTube. So this is actually live streaming right now on YouTube and we'll also provide recordings of the talks, um, post them on YouTube on our Hacker Dojo channel. Um, please remember to like and subscribe. Uh, um, so um, yeah, so did you know? Um, some of you know, but I'm not sure if everyone knows. I'm actually working on a little app called Donorable to help donors and potential donors to find their passion locally. So it's actually a project here at Hacker Dojo and uh, we're looking for volunteers. There's a couple of people who volunteered and we're just kind of getting going. Um, so this is a great way for donors to find um, organizations in their area. I, did you know Mountain View actually had an opera company? Um, it's called Free Range Opera. It was actually the only reason I knew about it because my, my friend was actually running the thing as a little nonprofit and he was putting on operas here in Mountain View. Um, so this app will be able to help you find these things in your local area. We're going to start with the Bay Area and grow from there. Um, so um, with that, if you're asking to volunteer, you come talk to me after all this is over. Um, and that would be awesome. So I do need to cover a couple of important points before we get started. We have beer in the back, blue moon everyone, and coffee. Please help yourself. Um, also our fabulous dojo is equipped with laboratories hidden by the lovely mural on the back wall. In the likely event of emergency, we do have exit doors on the either side behind me and one over there. Um, all marked with these bright green exit signs, you can see if you look way up. Please remember to be respectful to our speakers and everyone else here tonight. Um, we are recording tonight. Please be excellent to each other. Um, it's our motto here and it's a lot more fun that way. Um, fasten your seatbelts. We have a great lineup for you tonight. Um, we've got Yash, Jorge, Walter, Aji, Alex, Wayne, Saka, Tim, and Elchin. And um, Jorge is going to kick it off tonight. He is, um, oh, Yash is starting. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yash is starting. He's a uh, senior strategy partner for the AI ecosystem at Intel. And he's also president of the Silicon Valley ACN chapter. And he will be talking to us about the AI workshop.
everyone. Um, this is my first time at Hacker Dojo in a lightning talk, so forgive me if there's any slip ups or whatever not, but I'm really excited to be here. I have found an amazing community um, over here, and I can't believe that I've not been a frequent uh, you know, attendee to um, Dojo events. Having said that, I'm looking to change that in the near future. It's starting off with this really kick-ass workshop that we're putting together. So a quick introduction, my name is Yashesh Shroff. I um, just this year took on the role of uh, uh, chair position at um, the SFB chapter of ACM. We are a nonprofit, much like uh, Hacker Dojo here. We've been around for at least 40, 50 years, so I think we beat meetup.com by a smudge of uh, you know, a few years or decades. And the purpose of ACM really is to help you know, with all things computing, right? That's, that's really the big focus. Uh, I know there's IEEE that does you know, all across engineering you know, events and everything else. So the focus of ACM and our focus in this chapter is to help with two things. One, build a community around computing, allow folks to basically do career changes, um, and we do this in a way that's not super expensive, right? We do it in a way that's extremely affordable, so you get the knowledge that you need and you're able to bring in the quality speakers that allow us to put these programs together, right? So Hacker Dojo is uh, really an excellent place for us to have this. Um, so if you're a regular visitor here, you just have to come back here on March 11th and 12th. It's gonna be a long weekend, but you're gonna have a lot of fun learning some really amazing things. So what are we talking about? In the world of AI, um, you develop models, you have a DevOps team that basically puts the models into production, and there's all this other, you know, loot boxes, right, that go around this main kernel that's your uh, model that keeps changing in production. Things change, things take off, um, and in the fortunate happenstance, you want to be able to scale everything that's going into production. You need to have observability that allows you to know when unexpected events essentially create, um, you know, disruptions in the inference that your model is providing, essentially impacting business. So, if you're a developer, if you're a program manager, if you're a product manager, there are certain things that you wanna be aware of in terms of how to scale these things. So, going back to maybe about a decade, Berkeley's um, AI group uh, came up with Spark that allowed you to do large data, big data compute, right? Um, some of that basically got offshooted into a company called Databricks. Uh, Follow-up work um, in that lab, uh, Amp Lab at Berkeley, resulted in the creation of Rig, which is really addressed to uh, solving the problem of scale with AI, and being able to do it in a way that doesn't break the bank, right? Um, and so they also, um, like Spark was open sourced. Uh, so we're really fortunate that as ACM, uh, as of the ACM, we're able to partner with AnyScale, that's the uh, company that's uh, bringing Ray to the world uh, in a commercial way. And we have an excellent speaker in the form of Camille, Jules, Jules actually wrote a book on Spark, and uh, Emmy Lee. And so together, because uh, it's you know uh, two, two solid days of workshop, um, they'll be actually taking us through a journey of uh, you know everything from soup to nuts, right? Getting your model out and into production. So AnyScale has built out this really amazing infrastructure that allows you to do this, and so you have access to all of that. Um, but after the class is over, you can run this on your laptop as well. So there's nothing that's you know really proprietary that you need to be doing. You learn the core open source tool. Great. That's that's really the idea. Um, I'll, I'll take 30 seconds and just say that look, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, um, amazing uh, content that's actually built out over here. And um, uh, go ahead and check out ray.io. And once you're done, um, come to um, the Eventbrite uh, page. Uh, there's, there's a QR code here. And uh, let us know if you have any questions. I'm really happy 
come around for a few more minutes at a class. Um, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, folks. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. I, I enjoy very much to have these kind of talks, uh, the lightning talks. And I, I am looking into the future and I try to figure out what we can do in some time. As you see here, we are talking about Mountain View in 2025. That means two years from now. And one of the things that we try to do is the lightning talks, how they change the world five minutes at a time. That is something that we would like to see. Can you imagine have the lightning talks hype uh, train with 72 lightning talks in a row? It's a crazy idea. Today we are broadcasting with uh, using YouTube and sending that information. And today can be seen anywhere in the world. I was chatting with a friend in Argentina last week, or this week, and say, hey, what happens in, in Argentina at 6 o'clock in the afternoon and we have a lightning talks and we swing? And then, one hour later, we find a location like uh, Colombia, for instance, and invest a little bit of time and looking how to be doing this event in Bogota, in Santiago, every hour in different locations. We have, in an hour, we can have 10 minutes uh, for a presentation and that 10 minutes is six presentations after five hours we have 30 presentations and doing that every week that would generate a tremendous things that maybe in the future and that's the dream can you imagine that more than 4,000 startups born in all Latin America with the French ideas that are launched in these conversations how the lightning talk international can become self-sustainable and provide some support even for the hacker dojo. Is we are looking how to get some financial resources. Why we cannot do that is sponsored by people everywhere. Now we are thinking Latin America, but I can see who of these place are from Europe, from India, from uh, uh, Oceania, for different places. Why we cannot do that like the New Year Eve that we have 24 hours around? That sounds crazy, but that generates a huge amount of employment. It can generate sales for 11 million, billion dollars, and maybe that is going to increase the salary. And for people here in Silicon Valley, if we say $20,000 person a year, looks like maybe it's not enough to pay the McDonald's. But for people, other locations around the world, $20,000 is much more money that they can do that in a way. And that is one of the things, how we can engage that people. And this, this thing happens and in, in, in locations and here in the Valley, we say it takes a real expert to make something simple. You talk with people here in Silicon Valley, you come here to the dojo, and you talk to a guy, oh, I just got a $25 million investment. I, I am expanding my business into different locations and different places. That is the kind of things that appears to be simple when you are talking with a person that already know about that. But can you imagine for a person that never asked for an investment, that never asked 
how to build an application that never asks how to scale a company. That looks very, very tough. In that sense, we want to have a learning experience that challenge yourself to explain these crazy ideas in five minutes. The, the exercise and the rehearsals to be sitting here or standing by here and chat five minutes and give an idea looks very simple. But in a lot of places, they do not know how to cut the, the chase and do that in that amount of time. In that amount of time. Reaching all kinds of people anywhere. It's, here is a beautiful, we enjoy to the people that we come very often to the Hacker Dungeon. We meet a lot of people, but now, how we make it that, that the people meet everywhere. Enjoy meeting people locally or remotely. And the benefits, in, in, in some ways, in the, in the press, I'm surprised is people talking that the Silicon Valley is going down. That's not true. Really, Silicon Valley is going very, very strong and is going to be much more stronger as the, all this uh, pandemic and all that uh, problems we have been saying. And why we don't reinvent that as a world of Silicon Valley in a virtual world? Business exchange should be a very good opportunity. Knowledge exchange is important and a learning experience for everybody. In that sense, we are done, and thank you very much for listening to that. Thank you, Gordon. Any questions? We're going to, okay. to be the first ambassador outside and try to do it. We already are doing that uh, idea for starting in, in, in very soon in Argentina and in Mexico. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Walter. He's a Google development ambassador. He doesn't work for Google. He's working for a, um, a large major bank, and he's going to be talking about Google Cloud for startups. Walter.
then I want you to know about it because a few people know about it. And then the good thing is, even before you get any funding, if you apply and they accept you, so immediately you get two thousand dollars to do. I don't know how many are doing uh, self funding, uh, bootstrapping now. I raise a hand here. And um, maybe consider this because uh, just like two thousand is a long way to go to Google account. I hardly can use a hundred bucks uh, in my in my Google account. So a lot of things are free, and then I uh, try this one. And if you get funding, then even better. If you enroll in this program, they give you a hundred thousand. So it's a good thing, and they have expertise. They have other thing, uh, people to help you uh, make the best use of use of Google Card. And then uh, this one is uh, one of the choices. Widgets. When you go to cloud computing, first thing you talk about is: is this global? Is this regional? If it's regional, then which region? So like this case, uh, U.S. West Oregon is ten percent less than U.S. East. So default may work for you, but default sometimes will cost you. So sometimes you know you go to uh, some car provider, the default is US East. But if you pay US West, then uh, maybe ten percent less already. And startup is like a uh, sort of money, right? So every penny comes. So you you can save ten percent in your uh, overall cost, then it will be better, right? And besides cost, the other one is latency. Are you close to your customer? Are you close to your major supplier? So in this case, you can see. If you, your major customer base is San Francisco and you put it in somewhere in US East, then you can see just latency alone is 3x rather than the US West. So the choice is important. Pick the right choice, then you are happier. You won't run into that problem like Germany, new stuff, uh, low capacity, and no all that So these are the criteria. And then future capacity. If you host the region in that case, like US West, like you are having a heavy problem, your growth is millions, like uh, other stuff. Then uh, would they allow you to add capacity, database, workloads, compute, storage, driver, all these things? Then uh, you need to make sure you uh, pick the right choice. And then like this case, he has a website. He put it in Germany, you can see latency about 250, right? He moved it to US East, latency about uh, 150. And then move it here, latency about 100. So what I find is, uh, what? <laughs> Just one more, one more second. What I find is the choice is important. Because what I find, you are a new staff, right? You want Google Core Index and know your uh, website and then uh, do better SEO, right? Search engine optimization. So you, you put just US West, they like you more. They call you faster. Then uh, they index you better. Then your SEO ranking probably better too. So just the choice alone is important. And I don't have much time, but I have actually a lot more slides. If enough interest, let me or a second note, then I can come back for a longer section and go over all the slides. Like you have computer network storage, how to choose each one. I have all the slides, I can show you more in a longer section. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, interested in uh, uh, talking to you more. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Uh, I thought that only AWS has that. So this hundred thousand is a credit or a credit? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, like you can see, like for example, like you you have a heavy problem, you can use a hundred thousand. I know a guy who sell something uh, on it, and then they hardly use two hundred a year, but he making like two hundred thousand uh, in revenue. So if you can use a hundred thousand, it's a very really happy problem. So that means you have a big user database and then you are successful. Thank you. Well, okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well. Next up we have a G, software engineer, uh, uh, mushroom.dg. And you're talking about GraphQL? Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to be here uh, talking about GraphQL, this might be 
Uh, there's a second one uh, doing the introductory, so this might be useful for people who are uh, trying to build new applications. So whenever we are building a new web application, then we have choices of which application layer to use so that uh, we get the data from the, from the backend. Uh, so typical choices are like designing a REST API. So you, you have APIs for getting the data out of the backend. You have some get request, post request, and things like that. So uh, an alternative to REST APIs is using GraphQL. And uh, we can see how that compares to REST API. Uh, so this is an example of a REST API. We, or issuing a get request uh, over HTTP to the endpoint book and retrieving the first uh, the book with ID one here, uh, and the server sends a response saying, "Okay, this is the type two, this is the author, and some what other data about that particular book." And so the same concept uh, when we transfer that to GraphQL, the query looks like this. This is also over HTTP. We are sending in uh, that request. The difference is that there's only one endpoint here, which is the GraphQL endpoint. And then there is a concept of uh, resolvers, which is similar to how we are handling that, those requests uh, in the backend. So here, uh, if we see, we are trying to request for a field uh, saying book with an ID one. And one of the advantages of GraphQL is that within each request, we can specify what fields we want. So here, in the previous example, if you see, the author had two fields defined, the first one and the last one. And then here, in GraphQL, maybe we are displaying only the first name of that particular author on that particular web page. So the advantage is that since the client is now requesting letter information, there would the number of bytes traveling over the network would be lesser, and so it is going to be faster. Uh, so that's the GraphQL example, and then the way that we uh, actually implement GraphQL is using queries and mutations, which is analogous to uh, create or update something on uh, the REST API. So the REST API <laughs> typically, typically has the four uh, operations for creating, reading, updating, and deleting. In GraphQL, we only have two operations. One is queries and the other one is mutations. Queries is basically like a read-only query, and mutation is for changing anything. Uh, uh, so we can think of comparing REST APIs to GraphQL in this manner, as in REST APIs have different endpoints, saying the endpoint for post, which could have uh, different parameters associated with all of these endpoints. Uh, and so if you had to, if you had a big web page which shows all the posts, all the comments, then basically you would have to fetch the data for all of, uh, for display, for making that whole web page look with using multiple queries to get uh, all of the posts, all of the comments of each post. Whereas with GraphQL, you can do all of that with just one query. So that will save you a lot of network bandwidth. Uh, and this is just one endpoint which can accumulate data from multiple sources and then just pass that data to the client in one network call. Uh, so yeah, we discussed the differences that we can, the client can only ask for as much information as they need. We can get all of the data in one single call, so that can save us time. There are uh, a certain trade-off or a uh, few problems with GraphQL is not the best thing out there. Uh, one of the things is that HTTP caching is already available by default on REST APIs versus not available on GraphQL. But these are usually solved with different implementations of GraphQL. Uh, and so if you are building up a new application, you can figure out the differences and compare it with our experience. That's all I have. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Arjun. Questions? Any question 
around Nest API versus GraphQL, mm -hmm. and because how much effort to take also for GraphQL in the fed up of any resource you have? Uh, so Nest API versus using GraphQL. Yeah, so I, I think that depends on the use case. If we have a use case where we care a lot about performance, uh, let's say not all of us have uh, a 5G connection, then you, if you care a lot about performance, then maybe using uh, GraphQL would be a better option uh, versus compared to doing something where you only need a few fields in each time, then maybe a REST API would be better. Uh, developed on REST API to GraphQL <coughs> easily or? Yeah, so I easy? think yeah, it will not be a lot of work. You can move one by one uh, each of the endpoints one by one to GraphQL. And so you don't have to do it all in one go. So it should be pretty easy for any of the implementations of GraphQL. Like Thanks. Apollo uh, is one example. <coughs> Great, thank you, Ajit. Next up, we have Alex, who's an enthusiast of the uh, Rust language, and he also runs our Rust uh, study groups here at Weekly at the Dojo. Thank you. So my name is Alex, and I'm your friendly neighborhood Rust enthusiast. Um, and by day, I'm also doing something else. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've already probably now heard of the Rust programming language. Uh, you know, the happy, moderate, memory-safe, performant, uh, and extremely fun to write programming language, Rust. Um, Rust was really designed mostly for uh, low-level uh, system development, uh, stuff like um, you know operating systems, uh, databases, file systems. Uh, web servers, proxies, that sort of stuff. Uh, but Rust also has a very enthusiastic uh, developer and enthusiast community, as you can see. Um, and there is a lot of incentive to basically stick Rust into every conceivable area of activity. And in particular, uh, some developments over the past year have allowed Rust uh, to basically reach uh, par from the performance and development, uh, like developer experience, with contemporary JavaScript meta frameworks uh, for doing for application development. Um, there actually has been a lot of interesting uh, work in the land of JavaScript for web development in terms of server client models, in terms of uh, code generation techniques, in terms of code splitting between workloads that are done in the client, done on the server, uh, handed off from the client to the server, uh, all kinds of really exciting stuff uh, that Rust really wasn't supposed to be doing as well. <coughs> and yet, uh, certain technologies that have uh, been maturing over the past couple of years actually enabling Rust to essentially reach parity with uh, the, uh, the experience and the performance of building and running JavaScript applications. Uh, and in particular, uh, one so one technology that is enabling Rust to enter this particular niche is Rust or WASM, or WSM, or whatever you want to call it, uh, which is basically a standard for a portable virtual machine uh, that has been implemented in all the major browsers, uh, you know, Firefox, Chrome, whatever. Um, there are standalone, standalone implementations uh, for things like container technologies, Docker, and friends. Um, but one thing it allows it to do is, uh, well, is that Rust can target, the Rust compiler can target WebAssembly as a compilation target, and then ship artifacts that run directly in the browser. Uh, and not just Rust, in Frank. Uh, like there's a lot of folks who are basically taking existing legacy C and C++ applications and with relatively minimal modifications, shipping them to browsers, shipping them to new environments, shipping them to things where they really shouldn't be able to run, like really horrifying, mind-numbing things. Um, like I had a demo a little bit earlier where somebody was actually running Windows 3.1 directly in the browser with like minimal changes, and it was just terrifying. Um, but 
Yeah, so you can basically write the same code in Rust for front ends, back ends, servers, clients, browsers, uh, you know, uh, the Lambda and serverless environments, and share the same types, share the same code, share the same developer experience, and run the stuff on the server, run the stuff on the client, hand things uh, like hand work off from one to the other in exactly the same ways that you've been able to do in a JavaScript if you've been writing JavaScript. In particular, uh, there's a few pretty stable technologies. Uh, there's something called U, uh, which uh, U is a kind of tree. I guess the name is a pun on Elm, which is a JavaScript-based technology. Uh, there is another exciting tree thing, uh, Sycamore. Um, and these things actually uh, pretty closely uh, parallel the experience of uh, writing Elm, React, uh, like very standard bread and butter JavaScript code. Um, the one that I've been a fan of in the last couple of weeks is something called Leptos, uh, which is very similar to uh, very similar to uh, a framework for JavaScript called Solid, um, and it's it's really quite surprising that uh, you know given Rust's like given Rust's reputation for being complicated, challenging, difficult, hard to write, uh, like requiring you to do all kinds of bookkeeping, that you can get a developer experience that very closely resembles. Uh, the experience of writing, you know, JavaScript code and kind of batteries into the metric work. Um, and just as a little bit of a code example, we'll just take a look at, uh, what am I looking at? Uh, let's take a look at this um, little minimal, uh, like, like just a little web example, basically. And if you've written any React at all, um, like this looks a lot like JSX. Um, and you have your HTML looking crap over here, and you have components that have lambdas that run in them and supply values. You have signals. You have you know your readable and your writable signals. Um, you inject these things into templates. Uh, this is all, by the way, powered by Rust's extended support for uh, compile time macros. So there's type safe comp like compile time macros, um, and then just like in React, you would just kind of mount your application into some component in your HTML, and then it just runs. And we'll just run the damn thing, I suppose. Um, and I mean, it's a whole little example, so it's a counter, but it goes up and it goes down, and um, and that's for us, like, bizarre. Awesome, thank you. several pretty good frameworks. The one I'm showing right now is Leptos. So you use that one as well? Yeah, uh, that was the little Hello World example. But just like I said, there is, uh, like Leptos is very new, uh, although increasingly stable. Uh, Sycamore is a popular choice. U is a popular choice. And these are specifically front end things, things that imitate React. Uh, for backends, uh, there's also several very viable production rate choices. Uh, Actix and Axum are very popular examples. And there's a Entire race to basically be like the winner in this space. So there's a lot of creative ferment and enthusiasm. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll take a look at it. Uh, you mentioned it's persistence. Is it uh, memory managed or the pointers or direct memory access, that kind of thing? Rust itself. Um, Rust is kind of the dream language for the C refugee. Um, so C in you know, last decade and a half or so has gotten a lot of things like reference counted values and uh, move semantics and smart pointers to basically hide the terror of pointer manipulation from the developer. And Rust very much takes after the philosophy. Uh, so Rust has very strong enforcement of uh, memory safety. It has, like its compiler does multiple passes to basically avoid memory erasing. And instead of just raw pointers, in most situations, you basically have things that are effectively smart pointers. Okay, so uh, I was wondering if you were really concerned about this Rust over the next three or four months or something, so you know, like for future applications, will we go over to the Rust over like other languages or just the Python or the Rust alternative? Um, do you really like, uh, do you, do you, we should be using for that purpose or like how should we then start thinking like push it? Like, it's, it's definitely a trade-off. 
Uh, like Rust is not going to be my first choice for prototyping something. It's definitely language requires more forethought and more trial and error. At the same time, um, the reason you're going to reach for Rust is because of higher performance, and that's because you want you know you, you want to run, run less compute uh, and less memory. So it's going to save you money in terms of like just runtime performance. Also, many of these solutions are reaching maturity, so if your microservice is very simple, you can basically just get by with copy paste and go with it. Whereas earlier, you would have to like you know hold up your sleeves and write a bunch of stuff and like figure a bunch of stuff out, and that would have been slower than the alternative of just reaching for you know class for something to go or whatever. But these things are maturing, and now it is very feasible to like write minimal boilerplate microservices in Rust without really a lot of overhead. Oh, oh, yeah, and I also have a Rust meetup that meets bi-weekly over here in the classroom, so uh, please feel free to check out the Hacker Dojo event calendar and come to my thrilling Rust meetup, where you'll learn all about these advanced and futuristic technologies. Oh, I think that's it. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Next up, we have Wayne, um, Master Web Engineer and Performance Engineer, which is the uh, fastest website possible. Uh, okay, hello. I'm just here to talk about SSR today. Um, for those of you who have, haven't heard, um, SSR is uh, SSR is a way of rendering um, web apps but doing as much of the rendering work on the server. Um, this is becoming increasingly popular, so for those who are wondering whether you should jump in, um, I hope the talk will convince you. Um, the stakes of SSR in general, in terms of performance, is about 100 milliseconds. Um, so, it's, so don't imagine SSR is gonna be like a dream for performance, but it can shave about 100 milliseconds off. Um, and it's also gonna improve SEO, primarily because um, when a scraper visits your website, it's always going to visit a fully rendered HTML page. It's going to be the jump. It's going to be the crawl your site for links and continue to jump through the links. Um, so let's look at an example. Of, let's look at a picture real fast. Uh, here we are. Please. Okay. So in this picture, we can see what. Um, Serving a React bundle or a Vue bundle or an Angular bundle used to look like. So we have the client over here, and over here is your data center. Um, this is your server, and this is any kind of API you could want to talk to, databases, auth servers. And what would traditionally happen is on number one, the client hits up your server, and um, that's about a 35 millisecond um, uh, latency, like uh, typically. The distance between you and the data center is around 35 milliseconds. Beforehand, I ping Twitter. There must be something wrong with the Hacker Dojo Wi-Fi because it was 60 milliseconds to ping Twitter. So um, then, then your savings will be dramatic. But here, let's assume a better scenario than what Twitter has got. And assume there's a 35 second millisecond distance between you and the data center. And this is just for a communication latency, not for compute latency. And so the client talks to the server, and the server already has this pre-built bundle of HTML, CSS, and JS. And the server's about to send over the bundle on the second trip. And so that's about 70 milliseconds of latency just for communication. Uh, except if for any of you who have developed in React or Vue or Angular or any of these uh, other frameworks, um, you'll know that if you peek inside the HTML file for early days, uh, the HTML file is basically blank. It has almost nothing inside of it. There's a div somewhere that says div uh, ID equals app, um, and then a whole bunch of JS files. And so what happens is, once the bundle is sent over, your browser reads the, job, reads the top of the HTML file, notices in the header there's a JavaScript file. It starts reading the JavaScript file. As it, as it runs the JavaScript file, um, it's gonna load React, or, or Vue, or whatever, and it starts to build your DOM. Um, as it builds your DOM, you may be using suspense or some other kind of query framework, or, or some kind of like um, data dependency framework, and um, it will begin to request data for you. And because you're using React Suspense or whatever, in the meantime, you'll be showing the user some spinning loaders. So now that your JSON app is loaded, you realize some data is missing. You make your, we go to number three. We request more data from the server. The server talks to your, data, uh, your database, 
And within data center, you should typically expect one to four milliseconds uh, between service latency. So basically, almost nothing. Um, okay, cool. Um, uh, so uh, then finally, on the last trip, um, we return with the data and the spinning loaders finish. So we are looking at about, in an optimistic scenario, um, at about 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds of communication latency alone. Uh, ignoring uh, any issue with compute latency. Now let's look at what frameworks are approaching today. And these are almost all frameworks, whether you're talking about React with Next or Remix or Vue with Nuxjs, Svelte with SvelteKit. Um, Angular hasn't caught up to the game, but um, so, uh, so this is what things look like today. So on the first request, the client talks to the server. And the server says, well, wait a minute. Um, I actually know what's inside my bundle, and I know what data needs I have. So why don't I, in that same trip, talk to my DB? And then um, in that same trip, I will load up your bundle uh, with data. And not only that, your bun I will also build the HTML for you so that it's not just a blank HTML file. It's a fully built up HTML file. So when a scraper hits your HTML file, the scraper can immediately find the next links. So now, um, on the second trip over, at around 70 milliseconds, the client gets the full request, the, the full bundle, the full app, including with the data. The DOM is ready to be built right away in the, by the HTML, and you don't actually even need JavaScript if you want to. Maybe you're a really, really slim website and you end up um, loading, no, loading no JavaScript at all. Um, so, let's go back to the slides. So um, these are all the frameworks that are using SSR, um, uh, this is just a quick example of what SSR might look like um, in one of many frameworks. So here's Astro. They have a funny kind of uh, syntax where it's a little YAML triple line up the top, and you write any kind of JavaScript you want. And here, down here, I access the data. Very simple. Let's look at another framework. Here's Solid. Uh, in Solid, I have a function. Um, it, it, the function can be named whatever I want, but inside, I grab some stuff from the web. Then over here, um, I use a magic function and I get the data. And this is what SSR looks like in most frameworks today. Um, since I have a little time left over, let me show you a quick website. So this is my website. Um, uh, this is running over SSR. The, the data from the blogs are stored in a database uh, called um, D1, which is Cloudflare's SQLite. And let's just click on random link. And it's a pretty good experience. If we look at the Google PageSpeed Insights, um, I'm getting 0.2 seconds uh, for time to interactive. So 0.2 seconds is not just the time it took to successfully transfer a website, it's the time it took to fully load my website and to become fully interactive with the largest first content full page. So of course, these kind of scores are very, very easy if you do SSR. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's not going to look as good. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, let's say I have a super complicated website with lots of React. Do you have any idea of how difficult or easy it would be to convert it into something that those sort of stuff in there? OK. Um, uh, I'd say it will. Um, can I ask real fast, are you doing a multi-page app or a single page app? Like, you expect to be really crawlable? No, I mean, I don't, I don't care too much about crawling. Okay, um, in that case, um, so, so would you say you, you're building a traditional app app, like single page yeah, app? Yeah, it's a single page React app. Okay, it's gonna be easy, but the thing is, you're gonna get far less benefit than a multi-page app scenario. Because, like, on the first load, like, like let's say I'm trying to load discord.com, which is a heavy app. Um, I'm willing to have the patience to wait an extra 100 milliseconds because Discord is about to deliver a lot of value, a, a lot of value to me. And after the Discord app is fully loaded, by then the data transport is fully managed by your app. So SSR doesn't matter as much anymore because your app is fully loaded. So let's say I'm clicking on one Discord tab to another Discord tab, uh, to one Discord channel to another Discord channel. By then, um, Discord should have already had the frame of the, the GUI of the app fully loaded in its assets. So you're gonna get far less benefit, except on the first load of your app. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but, but the answer is it's easy. Okay, great, thank you. All right.
be in Stockholm, and uh, he's our uh, web DevOps security engineer extraordinaire, and uh, he's going to talk about teleport and identity access management. What? said teleport it's access management tool which is plus CA because it why it was born in the first place uh, the thing was born because of complexity and the scale of the infrastructure and you should remember two things one is everybody is talking about edge security zero trust and second is static credentials how manage how to pay and all this stuff. So teleport is solving these two problems. The way it solved, you can see here, no identity, shared secret, network, setting up VPN, some of the VPN doesn't work and so forth. These all the challenges telecom teleport trying to address. And how it's doing that and the key models it has, uh, you can see here first accessing your node. It could be Kubernetes node, it could be EC2. Just virtual machines you're trying to access. Teleport enables that you can audit who did what, access each machine, or you can run the command in all the machines. So you can plug in your SSO identity, it could be Okta or GitHub, any IDP provider you have, and it will enable you to manage all these access and onboard for all the people who's accessing what. So Kubernetes access, there are a few ways for accessing Kubernetes, but role-based access, it's so, uh, in, in a way, inconvenient to set up all these all things and so forth. So it addresses that. Dev applications, so let's say you are putting your application behind the VPN, using Teleport, um, you, you, it can enable you for your internal application. You will talk to Teleport Proxy, which will enable all the internal application get to exposed more securely. And database access. You are so much scared, production databases, having the uh, proper audit around them, having the access management around them. So it definitely solves uh, all these cha challenges. And you can have all the temporary access management flow. The teams can uh, get you approved by their managers. And audit log, you can go and see who, which query run against your database. So all these challenges you have, you can just all the things pass to the teleport, which will handle it greatly. And desktop application, if you have Windows infrastructure, it works great. So accessing remote desktop and all these things, if it's use case for you, perfect, go for that. And I have here a few references I spoke last year in teleport conference and uh, 
just that I from here also I took the what you saw um what what chart is a uh, some of the chemical box including Kevin head of security at Discord John and me so it was great talk and that being said all my slides for the talk and the recordings are, are available I just added in the link so if you go to blogabout.com and find it and, or if you have a question feel free to come and talk to me overall uh, I, I say I am one of the, the happy customers and that was working great especially if you are in the development security team and managing it or secure them on the scale and taking all this burden out of your uh, shoulders so thank you Why I love Teleport one more reason because it, it has also open source. So you can go and play with it out of the box. It just works fine. And I touched a bit in my talk, but I, I'm planning also in the Golden Pass to put in the GitHub in a more nice way. So, so. anyone else? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have um, Tim. He's founder of Metpod, um, which is crypto operations for small and medium businesses. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm actually a friend of Zappos. So I was visiting him today, so it was very last minute addition here, so I don't have any presentations, so I, I didn't come here to do anything actually, just to give an idea of what we're doing. And I actually heard pretty cool speeches here about. GraphQL, Rust, and stuff. So I will try to connect how we're approaching this problem. So uh, we're not doing any kind of AD stuff here. It's actually, um, we have a threshold cryptography in the backend so that I can start from the beginning. So I know that you guys have a smart guy. So that is like what, what we're trying to solve, right? So you've heard about the FTX debug call and all of these problems are coming with the uh, custodial wallets, right? Uh, so what's happening is like you put your, um, you're buying something from Coinbase or somewhere else, most of the time actually the custody of your wallets are inside those exchanges. As in FTX, the guys disappear, your money disappears, your, your coins disappear. So we're approaching it from a, a little bit different perspective. We're looking at it from the non-custodial perspective and uh, applying threshold cryptography to solve this problem from a non-custodial perspective. How we're doing it, we're taking your private key, we're dividing it into a couple pieces in cryptographic sense, one piece might be in your server or our server, but the other one is going to be on your iPhone. So you could actually also, oh, I have a lot of time, so I can go a little bit slower. Uh, so basically what happens, it could be either on your iPhone, it could be in your server. So you could sign only upon your approval. So we cannot do anything even if we have half, half of your uh, privacy. So it's, uh, it's a cool uh, piece of special cryptography, so we're applying it to make these things easier. There are several companies that are doing this, but the problem is they're applying this technology for bigger banks and stuff. We're, we're trying to bring it to smaller customers, smaller, small to medium-sized businesses, and DAOs, and Web3 Gaming. Right? So, that's, uh, so this is our website. We're coming out just recently. From, for the beta testing, we have uh, several customers. So if you want to join and test us, please go ahead. It's Coca Cola Bar. You just need to send us your email and we'll, we'll get back to you. And so there's actually multi user wallet. We are building transaction streamlining, non custodial, offline recovery. This is a very important piece of information here. We have actually a separate app which you can recover your private key, full private key, and get out of our platform completely if you want. But you, and you can do it completely offline. Maybe some other day I can actually show some of the tools that we have. You can go on our website too if you would like to see what we have, like crypto treasures, DAOs, but big projects, investment plus, and, and this kind of things. So let me go a little bit, uh, since we have only two minutes, uh, discussion uh, of what technologies we're using. Uh, we're using GraphQL, we're using TypeScript uh, for our 
cryptography libraries we're using actually Go. So I looked in Rust libraries before. Uh, it, for us, it was Go was closer one, but I love the all the Rust libraries there. I am C++ developer myself. Um, I've been in the autonomous driving and robotic space for decades, and this is uh, uh, this caused my PhD in distributed systems space. So that's why I, I love this project. Uh, let me go here and just to try to show you basically. Oh, okay. So let me actually do this. If you want to sign up, you can actually just come here, fill in white code, and you can come and join and test our software and let us know what you think. Maybe it sucks. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're just building, we're testing, so we're open to any kind of criticism, right? Uh, let me actually show you what's inside of it, maybe. Oh, Tinker Assessor. So it's pretty fantastic anyway. I don't know why it's Tinker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So my private key is not here anyway. Oh, by the way, that's actually that was a cool thing. Even if you come in here, you cannot do anything, right? So you will need my phone. So you can actually start your transactions from here, right? Add transaction and blah blah. But for approval, you will actually need my phone. Why? Because some part of your private key will be on our server, but the other part is actually on your phone. So this, that, that's how we're adding actual extra layers of security. And there's more things you can do here. You can actually add your second phone as a signer, and your second phone can sign, or your wife can sign, or you can have a team of engineers or DAOs or like inside a DAO, any of them can sign. So we give you functionalities for adding wallets and also users, right? Here you can actually add users and give them signer role. Or, or the first user is gonna be a custodian and the other ones will be signers, any of them can sign. Oh, I'm almost there. So that's pretty much it. If you have questions, please let me know. I, next time, probably, I will drop by to talk about the bias and the AI as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes. Are you using Shamir and Dolphin for Power Yes, I Yeah, of course. MPC. We have several protocols on the MPC. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, does it replace a paper wallet? I use paper wallet because uh, I lost like three exchanges got hacked. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you will be perfect customer because... for us. So, I, <laughs> I'm really not kidding. So, so this... now I use paper wallet. So, you can lose your paper wallet as well. I know, but I think that is the safest for me. But Yes. You can replace it, right? Yes, exactly. So let me actually tell you how you can, uh, forget about our web, uh, our company as well. It, it, it's threshold to perfect if we look at that. So what, what it's actually offering you, you divide these keys, no one can sign instead of you. You have several uh, uh, several devices that you need to bring together and sign. Not bring together, they need to approve at, at the same time or asynchronously, that's not a problem. You could also back up your key, full key, someplace, and just recover it when you want. Backup will be encrypted backup anyway. So that, that, that encrypted backup will be like your, your paper thing. So you can keep it somewhere. You play with us, you do all the transactions with us, and tomorrow you, you come and say, oh, I think you got, you look like the FTX founder. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you say, okay, I'm willing to get out of here. So you just <coughs> get out. You take your key and you go somewhere else. Okay, I got one. I got one. Oh, yeah. Well, sure, sure, sure. All right, all right. Here's a question. So, are you using multi sig on the back end? No. So, how are you, how are you dividing the uh, the private keys? How's that working? Threshold cryptography. So, we're using like, very advanced cryptography libraries to do this, actually, based on some papers from Shamir and all that others. Okay. GGG is one of the famous papers. Like, right. Some of the protocols are GG, GGG, K9B. It came up from the, it's actually a cool background story. It came up from millennial problem. So this MPC thing actually came from a millennial problem. So you're a millennial, you're a millennial, and you, you're trying to figure out who is actually, who has, who, who's got more millions, but you don't want to tell each other like exact amount. So you have to like, come up with some protocols, which is called millennial problem, that figure out who has more money, but without revealing your money, your amount of money. So that's exactly what we're doing. I have 
piece of your private key, you have a piece of your private key to do something together and sign the transaction, but I never revealed my part of the uh, private key. So they never come together. So no one can hack it. Okay. In, the, in the, yeah. Uh, Real quick, how, 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 how do you break the, uh, the private keys and keep it only on the device like to verify to set up in your iPhone? Yes. Is that the same thing on the back that you use? No, but, um, actually, key is never together. So I'm just trying to simplify that into the breaking. The whole key, private key is never together. From the beginning, when you actually have NC protocols, the key is generated in parts. One of them, one part is going to be on the server, one part is going to be on the phone. And then they communicate with each other to the yeah. protocol as well to sign, to, to do some transactions. There should be handshake and then uh, signing. But they never come together. So there is nowhere actually break point where the keys come together and someone can steal at the time that they came together the whole key. It doesn't happen. This guy did genius. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Ivan Mamanov. He's a digital forensics analyst, analyst with uh, Fortnite. And he's going to talk about open source intelligence. of open source intelligence quickly. It's, it's a big world, so we don't have that much time. Uh, obviously, it's gathering of information, it's gathering information from publicly available sources for, for your intelligence uh, to make uh, better decisions. You can use it in uh, law enforcement, cyber security, military, corporate security, journalism, pen testing, uh, social engineering, so <clears throat> one of the, so from now I'm gonna just perform it a little bit. For example, we have a tool, Sherlock, it's in GitHub. So basically you can uh, give a username as an input and it's gonna give you like wherever this username is used, like in Twitter, Instagram, it will pull out. Let's see. So we have a C CSI Linux. So we have a CSI Linux. It is uh, it's basically a platform for uh, tools for open source intelligence. We have a lot of forensic tools, the dark web. So this is uh, basically a social online investigation. I have uh, used a lot of tools from here. For example, Quint is one of the good tools that you can uh, put Username, for example, you want to say, I was using uh, between, let's say there's a war going on between, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, allegedly, if you, you are using Kharkov for the city name, you are pro Russian. If you use Kharkiv, you are pro Ukrainian. Yeah, of course, there are exceptions. So you want to know that, okay, show me all the verified accounts, say, like, 10 miles radius of San Francisco that used hardcore as a hashtag. So this is one of the ways you can find like pro-Russian individuals or organizations or pro-Ukrainian. Pro so these are all the rules. Uh, so for example, I wanna say that uh, I'm gonna use, I hope you can see it. Whoever used hardcore uh, within 10 kilometer radius of Paris. Okay, so so that, then it's gonna find all the tweets that use that hashtag within ten miles, ten kilometer of Paris. And we have another, uh, a lot more. For example, you can find emails, phone number. So this is my favorite. Okay. So 
here. Um, social media. So we want to search for a username. Let's say I, I want to search my username, for example. So it's going to bring all the websites that I have signed up. So it's very interesting. Uh, open source intelligence is a very interesting yeah. field. Uh, you can do a lot more. I don't have a time. And it's more Linux-based. You can find these tools on Windows, but they are paid. But on Linux, most of them are uh, free. That's it. That's all I have. Questions? And by the way, by the way, just give me one second. This is a very good book. It's not available online, no PDF. So it's all a physical copy. Uh, Michael Basil, he was FBI agent for cyber cyber investigation for 20 years. And he wrote a book like thousands of tools that you can do cyber investigation uh, uh, for uh, open source intelligence. What is the name of the book? Or synth te techniques. And just give me one second. So there's a good website, actually his website. So here, uh, inteltechniques.com. So you can basically, uh, if you want to search for username, you can do a good sort of input. And for, uh, and this is also Facebook. Let's say if you want to, for someone who use certain words between certain time frame on Facebook. So it's gonna bring up. It's called foolforsuitblog.com. That's it. No need to do it, man. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's all I wanted. What's online? in this particular toolkit, are most of them focusing on social networks or are there also tools for analyzing uh, patterns in published media in newsletters and other kinds of online publications? Yes, Maltigo is a very cool tool, Maltigo. It is uh, for mostly for journalists who are investigating like crimes, money laundering. It's a very strong tool. Uh, my next uh, presentations, I may go on Maltigo, just Maltigo, and show how amazing it is. <coughs> I'm just curious, um, are there any major tools uh, for finding correlations in style to find different usernames but belonging to the same person? Uh, like alias? That? I don't know. Probably yes, but or it doesn't come to my mind, but probably, maybe I know, but. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Just curious of the writing uh, in, in the API, the location of the tool? It doesn't use Tintoy API at all. Quint, for example, this tool, uh, Quint. One second. This twin tool doesn't uh, use a Twitter API. So how do they know the location of the tweets? Uh, actually, I just found about this tool, so I can't answer that. But it's a good question that I need to find out. But I verified that. I verified that. And I check, manually check, to make sure it pulls out the right data. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. One more, one more. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. And I said we have John Sokal and Victor Lee who on every day talking about distributed peer to peer communication.
going? Hey. Okay. So I'm John Sokol. I've been a Dojo member from like the beginning. And, uh, you know, I, so I've been involved in a lot of stuff that are construction and some of the earliest CDMs in 92 and 94 uh, streaming video. So, um, you know, we started having a, an issue with Facebook and now we've seen the Twitter files and all these things. Um, so, the discussion came up is can we build some sort of peer-to-peer -peer thing that doesn't rely on back-end server infrastructure? Uh, as I go through here, Jack Dorsey said you can't use a company because as soon as you have a company, the government can come and subpoena you and put all kinds of pressure and, you know, you're forced to, to compromise. Um, so, we started thinking, well, can I execute code? Um, like in a browser tab, I've got an enormous amount of resources. I can access the GPU, I can do GLGS, uh, uh, web GPU, a number of things. I've got enormous amounts of storage. Um, with WebRTC, I can build a, a mesh network. Um, I can simulate a hard drive. I can also save up, you know, from a local tab out to the drives and then immediately back up the database information and put it back into the system. Um, <coughs> So I started looking at uh, building sort of a basic architecture uh, and, uh, you know, let me just say problem statement because it's not rich in. Uh, this is a good quote <laughs> from the guys at Twitter. Uh, here's Jack Dorsey's statement. So I started thinking, how can we build this? You know, here I'm getting banned for posting a clip from, from a, a Hollywood movie, you know. Uh, here, it's so common that, that people are selling pins, Facebook jail pins, and, and you know, memes all over the place. Uh, you know, another friend of mine made the observation that, that he's getting nothing but garbage in his feed at this point. Uh, nothing from his friends, you know, he didn't sign up for this stuff. It's just, you know, here's another former Dojo member who used to run a network. And completely the claim it was false information. It was a joke. You know, it was a joke. Like, yeah, of course it's not completely true, it's humor. But Facebook doesn't get it. So I'm like, okay, how can we resolve this? Uh, and I, I came up with sort of this, this idea where we're doing relays with WebRTC in the nodes. And before I started coding, I'm like, well, let me go look around and see what else is out there. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of ideas in this document, which I can share if anyone really wants to see it. Anyway. Um, you know, this is going back to some other ideas I had years and years and years ago about building, you know, distributed file system arrays and stuff like this uh, using erasure code. I have my own erasure code system called the DCIP. Uh, so anyway, um, let me cut to the chase. Where after doing this investigation, I started finding a number of tools. Pure JS, which is really cool. Pure Server, Croquette, which I really like. Uh, except that you you have to like have an account with them. So if I were to like publish something and the FBI would get annoyed or whatever, they could just turn me off. Uh, OSJS, which is just a really cool framework, um, but it doesn't have any of this stuff. So anyway, then I came across CYFS which is very interesting because they actually implemented something very close to what I had sketched out. Um, and then I ended up meeting uh, Mark Vidal here at the dojo like about a month ago. And his architecture is exactly what I sketched out too. So I've been really like banging my head against the brick wall trying to make this work. I'm not really a node person, so it's been quite a, a brutal learning lesson. Um, one of the interesting things, by the way, is ChatGPT has been priceless in helping me decipher this whole alphabet soup of HTML libraries that everything has been. Uh, and then there's another one that just came out, which is this Nostrum. So, um, let's see, I have a croquette here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, they have a, a real-time demo here. This is off of their website. This is a little example I've got on, on CodePen. And everything's synchronized. So I can open my phone right now, and you'll see it's going to be perfectly in sync. Um, the timing on this is amazing. Now, I think Gun can get the same level of, of accurate simultaneous timing as this, but I'm not sure. 
So anyway, my feeling is, you know, um, use the chat room to replace Facebook with this. Anyway. All right. My time's up. Questions? Facebook-like site where I can chat. Okay, I don't necessarily even want to encrypt anything. You know, if they want to go sniff it, I'm happy doing it all clear text. I just don't want them filtering it and, and oh, fact checking and you know, I want to send a, a, a binary to my son or some link and, and I'm blocked. You know, uh, there was a Yaza, which is a one of the most awesome electric vehicle freeze phase brushless DC motors and it's blocked on Facebook. I cannot share it because there's a Turkish politician with that same last name and it just hit the AI filter. And that's it. You just, you can't share the link. So it's like, you know, the, the, the filtering and censoring has gotten incredibly disruptive on just basic conversation. And you feel that Mastodon is not adequate? It, it might be, but I want something I have a little bit more control over. And, and I, I don't know, I haven't really ripped into the Mastodon source code, but I don't want a central server where they can go down. You know, I, I, I mean, okay, I think about it. I had a VBS in 87, one of the largest ones in the Bay Area called Turbosys. And, you know, one guy would copy the, the San Jose Mercury articles that were tech related or whatever, and then we'd discuss it. And, and on Facebook, this is exactly what I'm still trying to do. And I can't do it now. It's, it's, I'm being interfered with. So, you know, I just want to, like, discuss news articles with my friends without, like, having, you know, some old lady get in the middle of the conversation and start judging me. Okay, thanks a lot. Any other questions? Awesome. I got, I got one. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so just to pick back off the Mastodon, my experience with Mastodon was that it is distributed, but it is it's federated, and I noticed that uh, using different services, social media platforms on, on Mastodon, because there's multiple uh, services out there. Uh, with Mastodon, I got booted. I got booted for just you know uh, pu publishing links, and uh, because there is people that do manage uh, these these relays. Now with Nostra, on the other hand, that can't be stopped. People that do open up a relay can filter out your uh, your data, but indefinitely your, your data is pretty much on the, the Nostra protocol indefinitely. So that's what I like about Nostra in comparison to, to Mastodon. Yeah. Well, my, my point of view is if I'm posting something so bad, let the FBI come and arrest me. Don't yeah. sit here and interfere with just normal idle chatter. Yeah, I, know, I, the bar for that is so low. John, have, have, have you had a chance to uh, try out uh, Nostra? Not yet. I, oh. I, I've down, I've, I just found out about it today and I, I put the link in there and I started looking you're gonna, you're gonna be amazed that there's there's no filter. It's beautiful to see people. But all the thing is, the world. It, it's not peer to peer. Everything's going through their stupid relay. Going through the relay. relay does the same thing, but it's just a backup. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes the introductions for the web RTC like I proposed in my thing, and I think that's a critical step. The CYFS does this as well. Mm, okay. Sorry, one, one more quick question. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm still a bit vague on your vision, but um, I thought one of the worries of true peer-to-peer -peer is that eventually um, someone else's content will end up on my computer and that content could be leaked. Yeah, so maybe. now I'm at risk despite the fact that I was not the one who posted the material. Well, ideally there's some encryption or something where you're not like able to access the content. All right, thanks. You know. But also part of it is if it's more like a cache and you're only ca keeping copies of stuff in the thread anyway, you're not like mm -hmm. sharing and redistributing stuff you didn't look at. If we have like fully distributed uh, platform, how will people find each other if it's not indexed or we don't have like- I would share with you my key or my, my, my handle or some part, you know, way of finding me, you know. So in my case, you know, I've got my own web server domain. I can run 
uh, relay, and I also host web pages. I can put the code pick on, on GitHub, which putting a static page on GitHub is priceless. So now I can have a, you know put all this content up there and build you know virtual worlds with three D animations and all kinds of stuff, and go into a VR world, and and using Croquette have multiplayer interactive multiverse stuff without a backend server of any kind and no bandwidth fees and this shit where, oh, they're gonna give you $100,000 of credit. I don't need credit. This is free. <laughs> I can pull as much bandwidth as I want, as fast as I want, and I don't need credit to like use this bandwidth, which is basically, you know, we've got it free. Thank you. Oh, and if you look at Croquette, by the way, it, it runs like server modules in the browser, so it's like you know generating the content and rendering it in, in the browser, but everyone's synchronized for gaming, which is very interesting. And the same architecture should apply over to Gun as well. All right.